Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a teacher. And he comes to Jesus by night so that the other Pharisees might not see him seeking knowledge. Knowledge is the stock in trade of teachers. And it's been said, I think rightly so, about human nature that when you're good with a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So Jesus uh, is put in a position of needing to ask, answer questions by this Pharisee. And Jesus responds to his inquiries with knowledge he cannot comprehend. And so it must eventually be with all of us who seek God. Because God is infinite. And we are finite. We have limitations. And God does not. There is no question we can ask which God could not give a bigger answer than we were hoping for. There's actually more chance of an ant being able to comprehend us than there is of us being able to comprehend God. Because we have more in common with that ant than we have in common with God. God is not simply different in degree. The ant is a finite creature. A system of biology that's actually not all that different from ours. God is completely unlike us. So completely behind our comprehension. Now, on most Holy Trinity Sundays, the pastor will get up and try to illuminate this doctrine for us um, I've done that in the past. I may do it again in the future, but I'm not going to try and do that today. Today, I want to affirm for you that the doctrine of the Trinity is beyond your comprehension. It's beyond the comprehension of anyone who has ever lived. And I want to hopefully help you understand that that is a good thing. And something you should be thankful for. So I want to take just a few moments and ponder together, reflect. We don't often at our culture to stop for just a few minutes just to think about God as opposed to thinking about what God's rules are for us or something like that. Take a few moments and just reflect on who, who God is. And we're going to go a little bit deep together. Okay? Now God is different from us in kind, not simply degree. And you can note this from the ways we talk about God. Think about some of the ways we describe God. We're always using words that are negative. Because God is unlike anything in our experience. We may say God is immortal. Have you ever met an immortal? We have everyone you have ever met is a finite span of life. Someone who will live a certain length of time and die. God is not like that, so we call him immortal. Something we don't have in our experience. We call God maybe intangible, hard to grasp. That's also not true of anything else in our experience. Even when physicists look for the fundamental particles of life, they're using tools, big machines, that are looking for evidence of those particles. God is not like that. We cannot grasp Him. The only evidence we have of God is what He has chosen to give, him, give to us. It's not evidence we can find on our own. There are no data for us to look at apart from what God has shown us. And I'll get to that data in a minute. We might call God immutable or to use the word usually translated in 1 Corinthians, imperishable, incorruptible. God is unchanging. You've never met someone who isn't changing. I once heard somebody say that only the dead do not change, but that's not even true. Even the dead decompose and can be scattered to the four winds. God is not like that either. And even the things we might say in the positive about God are actually negations. I didn't know I had a PhD candidate in theology sitting in front of me when I preached this sermon, so you can correct me at coffee hour if I'm wrong. Um, but you think about what we, when we say something positive about God, what we're actually saying is that's not true of God in the same way it's true of us. God is eternal. That's a positive thing. But we're more than saying that He's merely long-lived. We're not saying that He's going to be around a lot longer than we are. 
We're actually saying God never had a beginning and never has an end. And the book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's saying a great deal more than that He's always the same. It's saying He's in all those places at one time. For God, every moment is the present. Most of my life is cut off to me. The present for me is a very narrow slice of my life. Most of my life is in the past. Probably less of my life at this age is in the future. But for God, every moment is the present. He's different than us in that way. He's eternal. We're caught in time. Now God also does not have being. God is being. You and I have being. I took on being about 45 years ago, give or take a few months, when my parents, in 1969 at some point, had a little romantic interlude. And somewhere in my mother's womb, or in the fallopian tube, two people ceased to be, and one new genetic combination came into existence, and I was there. This person, who would later be named Brett, I had a cause. I'm the effect, and I will have an end. At some point in the not so distant future, I will cease to be. I came into being as a result of someone else's action. God's not like that. One of the classic questions you get asked by confirmation students is, and it was just asked to me a couple weeks ago. Well, if God made us and God made the universe, who made God? The word God means the person who was never made. The one who is without any help. It's like a chain of dominoes. Remember they used to do this back in the 80s? Like they had these long chains of dominoes, hundreds and thousands of these things. God's the finger that pushes the first domino. There's no domino that falls and makes him fall. And even when we say God is love, we're not saying he does love much better than we do in our fallenness. All of our love, our experience of love has a little bit to do with need, maybe a little bit to do with greed. And even when we're doing it for the right purposes, there's mixture of motive in there. God's not like that. We're not even saying that. We're saying that God is love. The best and most passionate and most pure love you will experience in this world. Whether it be the love between soldiers who share a combat experience, love between spouses gathered at the rail to make vows to one another. Even the love of a mother or a child is but a dim and pale reflection of God who is love. The God revealed in and by and through Jesus Christ turns out to be not only utterly unexpected, but inexplicable. We don't even have the words to explain them to one another. This is why the church really only has two things we need to believe. Two dogmas that she preaches. And the word dogma has kind of a negative connotation in our, in our culture. But what it really means is two things that are mysteries beyond our comprehension. So we preach them to ourselves as much as to the world. The first is that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. We're going to hit that in the Athanasian Creed. There are things Jesus does in the Bible that only God can do, and there are things Jesus does in the Bible that are only possible for a human being. So in some way, in the person of Jesus Christ, God and man are truly present. And also that God is a holy trinity. One God, three persons. One essence. Three eternal, coexistent, divine persons in absolute community of which we can only be part. And in the person of God, unity and diversity are married forever in the perfect marriage. Now understand, there's a reason I'm getting into all this for you. Um, first of all, so we can just gaze in wonder upon our God for a few minutes and not wonder what He can do for us. But also to affirm for you that no one, no body, now or ever understands these things. These doctrines simply describe the data and they mostly do it in negative terms, telling us how we shouldn't think about these things. This ought 
to come from it. If you've ever wondered if you could really be a Christian because you don't understand the Trinity, welcome to the club. <laughs> I had a young person who was confirmed at our rail not too many years ago say to me, as they become more sophisticated, I'm just not sure I can believe in God as an old man in the sky. Good! That's not how Christians believe in Him anyway. If God could fit inside your limited brain, if you could, thought you could conceive of God, the only thing you could be absolutely certain of was that you had not gotten Him right. God is infinite. You are fine. You can look at God. You can wonder at God. You can even hear the word of God and be blessed, but you cannot understand God. A really great preacher in his retirement told me something one time. He said, well, all the good sermons I have ever preached, he said, all the good ones, and I preached some bad ones. He said, I, rem I reminded people of two things that was important for them to remember. One, there is a God. Two, you are not Him. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. There is a God, and that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, and in giving His only Son, gave Himself for the life of the world. This God has revealed Himself in Jesus Christ to be eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do not, we cannot understand this, but we can and should and even must praise God for it. For salvation beyond our deserving, for knowledge beyond our capacity, for a destiny beyond our imagination. Communion with Him forever. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, as You have revealed Yourself to us, showing us what perfect communion looks like in Your own divine persons. We pray, O Lord, that our lack of knowledge would be no impediment to our faithful discipleship. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to look with awe and wonder upon you, be drawn ever toward you. We might be more faithful disciples in this life, that by the Spirit's power we might be better witnesses, that in the fullness of time we might enjoy communion with you who has known communion from the beginning. So forever praise your name, which is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
morning, and for all of our Sunday school teachers and Bible school teachers who help us too. We thank you. We're thankful for Mrs. Mullen and Mrs. Lee and all of you to help us bring praise to you through their gifts of music. And we thank you too for our birthday family, mothers and fathers and siblings and cousins, and for the relationships that you have given us and for your help in watching those relationships grow in the way that we best serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so before you go back to your seat, if you want a paper and a crayon, do the name of Google Prayer. Grab a crayon on your box, like that. Thanks for being here tonight. St. John, the third chapter. We begin at the first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a teacher. And he comes to Jesus by night so that the other Pharisees might not see him seeking knowledge. Knowledge is the stock in trade of teachers. And it's been said, I think rightly so, about human nature that when you're good with a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So Jesus is put in a position of needing to ask, answer questions by this Pharisee. And Jesus responds to his inquiries with knowledge he cannot comprehend. And so, 
it must eventually be with all of us who seek God. Because God is infinite. And we are finite. We have limitations. And God does not. There is no question we can ask which God could not give a bigger answer than we were hoping for. There's actually more chance of an ant being able to comprehend us than there is of us being able to comprehend God because we have more in common with that ant than we have in common with God. God is not simply different in degree. Ant is a finite creature with a system of biology that's actually not all that different from ours. God is completely unlike us. So completely behind our comprehension. Now, on most Holy Trinity Sundays, the pastor will get up and try to illuminate this doctrine for us. Um, I've done that in the past. I may do it again in the future, but I'm not going to try and do that today. Today, I want to affirm for you that the doctrine of the Trinity is beyond your comprehension. It's beyond the comprehension of anyone who has ever lived. And I want to hopefully help you understand that that is a good thing. And something you should be thankful for. So I want to take just a few moments and ponder together, reflect. We don't often at our culture stop for just a few minutes just to think about God. As opposed to thinking about what God's rules are for us or something like that. Take a few moments and just reflect on who God is. And we're going to go a little bit deep together. Okay. Now God is different from us in kind, not simply in degree. And you can note this from the ways we talk about God. Think about some of the ways we describe God. We're always using words that are negative. Because God is unlike anything in our experience. We might say God is immortal. Have you ever met an immortal? We have... Everyone you have ever met is a finite span of life. Someone who will live a certain length of time and die. God is not like that, so we call him immortal. Something we don't have in our experience. We call God maybe intangible, hard to grasp. That's also not true of anything else in our experience. Even when physicists look for the fundamental particles of life, they're using tools, big machines, that are looking for evidence of those particles. God is not like that. We cannot grasp Him. The only evidence we have of God is what He has chosen to give, him, give to us. It's not evidence we can find on our own. There are no data for us to look at apart from what God has shown us. And I'll get to that data in a minute. We might call God immutable, or to use the word usually translated in 1 Corinthians, imperishable, incorruptible. God is unchanging. You've never met someone who isn't changing. I once heard somebody say that only the dead do not change, but that's not even true. Even the dead decompose and can be scattered to the four winds. God is not like that either. And even the things we might say in the positive about God are actually negations. I didn't know I'd have a PhD candidate in theology sitting in front of me when I preach this sermon, so you can correct me, coffee hour, if I'm wrong. Um, but you think about what we, when we say something positive about God, what we're actually saying is that's not true of God in the same way it's true of us. God is eternal. That's a positive thing. But we're more than saying that He's merely long-lived. We're not saying that He's going to be around a lot longer than we are. We're actually saying God never had a beginning and never has an end. When the book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's saying a great deal more than that He's always the same. It's saying He's in all those places at one time. For God, every moment is the present. Most of my life is cut off to me. The present for me is a very narrow slice of my life. Most of my life is in the past. Probably less of my life at this age is in the future. But for God, every moment is 
is the presence. He's different than us in that way. He's eternal. We're caught in time. Now God also does not have being. God is being. You and I have being. I took on being about 45 years ago, give or take a few months, when my parents, in 1969 at some point, had a little romantic interlude. And somewhere in my mother's womb, or in the fallopian tube, two people ceased to be, and one new genetic combination came into existence, and I was there. This person, who would later be named Brett. I had a cause. I'm the effect, and I will have an end. At some point in the not-so-distant future, I will cease to be. I came into being as a result of someone else's action. God's not like that. One of the classic questions you get asked by confirmation students, is, and it was just asked to me a couple weeks ago, well, if God made us and God made the universe, who made God? The word God means the person who was never made. The one who is without any help. It's like a chain of dominoes. Remember they used to do this back in the 80s? Like they had these long chains of dominoes, hundreds and thousands of these things. God's the finger that pushes the first domino. There's no domino that falls and makes him fall. And even when we say God is love, we're not saying he does love much better than we do in our fallenness. All of our love, our experience of love has a little bit to do with need, maybe a little bit to do with greed. And even when we're doing it for the right purposes, there's mixture of motive in there. God's not like that. We're not even saying that. We're saying that God is love. The best and most passionate and most pure love you will experience in this world. Whether it be the love between soldiers who have shared a combat experience, love between spouses gathered at the rail to make vows to one another. Even the love of a mother or a child is but a dim and pale reflection of God who is love. The God revealed in and by and through Jesus Christ turns out to be not only utterly unexpected, but inexplicable. We don't even have the words to explain them to one another. This is why the church really only has two things we need to believe. Two dogmas that she preaches. And the word dogma has kind of a negative connotation in our, in our culture. But what it really means is two things that are mysteries beyond our comprehension. So we preach them to ourselves as much as to the world. The first is that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. We're going to hit that in the Athanasian Creed. There are things Jesus does in the Bible that only God can do, and there are things Jesus does in the Bible that are only possible for a human being. So in some way, in the person of Jesus Christ, God and man are truly present. And also that God is a holy trinity. One God, three persons. One essence. Three eternal, coexistent, divine persons in absolute community of which we can only be part. And in the person of God, unity and diversity are married forever in the perfect marriage. Now understand, there's a reason I'm getting into all this for you. Um, first of all, so we can just gaze in wonder upon our God for a few minutes and not wonder what He can do for us. But also to affirm for you that no one, no body, now or ever understands these things. These doctrines simply describe the data and they mostly do it in negative terms, telling us how we shouldn't think about these things. This ought to come from you. If you've ever wondered if you could really be a Christian because you don't understand the Trinity, welcome to the club. <laughs> I had a young person who was confirmed at our rail not too many years ago, say to me, as they become more sophisticated, I'm just not sure I can believe in God as an old man in the sky. Good! That's not how Christians believe in Him anyway. If God could fit inside your limited brain, if you could, thought you could conceive of God, the only thing you could be absolutely certain of was that you had not gotten Him right. 
God is infinite. You are fine. You can look at God. You can wonder at God. You can even hear the word of God and be blessed. But you cannot understand God. A really great preacher in his retirement told me something one time. He said, all the good sermons I have ever preached, he said, all the good ones, and I preached some bad ones. He said, I, rem I reminded people of two things that was important for them to remember. One, there is a God. Two, you are not Him. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. There is a God, and that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, and in giving His only Son, gave Himself for the life of the world. This God has revealed Himself in Jesus Christ to be eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do not, we cannot understand this, but we can and should and even must praise God for it. For salvation beyond our deserving, for knowledge beyond our capacity, for a destiny beyond our imagining. Communion with Him forever. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, as you have revealed yourself to us, showing us what perfect communion looks like in your own divine persons, we pray, O Lord, that our lack of knowledge would be no impediment to our faithful discipleship. Help us, O Lord, to, to look with awe and wonder upon you. Be drawn ever toward you. We might be more faithful disciples in this life. That by the Spirit's power, we might be better witnesses. That in the fullness of time, we might enjoy communion with you who has known communion from the beginning. And so forever praise your name, which is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
page 54 in your green hymnal. The Athanasian Creed is a long creed. It is confirmed by the witness of the Lutheran Confessions. We usually do it once a year as a response of reading, so we will read this in the manner that we do our psalms. Well, I will read the first line, and you may respond to uh, the second or third lines after that. Whoever wants to be saved, whoever does not regard it, now this is the Catholic faith. For the Father is one person. But the deity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is one eternal glory, co eternal majesty. What the Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Uncreated by the Father, uncreated is the Son, uncreated is the Spirit. The Father is infinite. Eternal is the Father. Eternal is the Son. Eternal is the Spirit. And yet there are not three eternal beings, but one which is God. As there are not three uncreated and but one which is uncreated and unlimited. Almighty is the Father. Almighty is the Son. Almighty is the Spirit. And yet there are not Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords. As Christian truth compels us to acknowledge Jesus. Person as God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods of the Lord. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten. The Son was neither made nor created, but was the only begotten of the Father. The Spirit was neither made nor created, but it is proceeding from the Father and the Son. Thus there is one Father. are in themselves. Whoever wants to be saved, it is necessary for eternal salvation. For this is the true faith. He is God begotten before all worlds, from the beginning of the Father, and He is man born in the world, from the beginning of His mother, existing fully as God, and fully as man, with a rational soul and human body, equal to the Father in divinity, subordinate to the Father in humanity. Although He is God and man, He is not divided. He is united because God has taken humanity into Himself. He does not transform deity into humanity. He is completely one. He is person without confusing His natures. For as the rational soul and body are one person, so one Christ is God and man. He suffered death for our salvation. He descended into hell and rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people shall rise bodily to give him an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life. Those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without believing this firmly and faithfully. I invite the congregation to be seated and our new members to come forward with their sponsors. You will need the white insert from your bulletin for reception of new members. As they come forward, I would say not everyone was able to be here today. Um, so you'll want to look at the uh, new member board to see pictures and see uh, who, you can, who you can greet as you pass them in the hall for the first time. Dear members of Christ Hamilton United Lutheran Church, these people having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God desire to become members of this congregation. Friends in Christ, we are all received into Christ's Holy Church through the sacrament of Holy Baptism, through prayer, study, scripture, worship, and fellowship. You have been led by the Holy Spirit to affirm your baptisms and claim together our covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of this church. We gather as a congregation to glorify Christ and support each other in becoming better disciples using the gifts which the Holy Spirit bestows. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before His Father in heaven those who faithfully confess Him on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that the teachings of this congregation as summarized in the Lutheran Confessions and our restatement of faith are faithful and true to the Word of God as recorded in the Holy Scriptures? Do you intend to continue steadfast in the Christian faith, being diligent in worship and the reception of Holy Communion, to grow in your understanding of God's Word and to seek a godly life even unto death? Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? Thank you. Members of Christ Hamilton, will you, by your prayers, time, conversation, and consolation, support these people in their desire to be more faithful disciples, children of the same Heavenly Father, giving glory to Christ alone? We will not say the Apostles' Creed, since we just said it much more eloquently or at length in the Athanasian Creed. So having heard your promises, we, the members of Christ Hamilton United Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like you to turn around. I'm going to introduce you to our congregation so they can recognize your faces. We'll start at this end. This is, um, this is Jeff Rowalt with his children. And Eric, his wife, Erica, was not able to be with us. Uh, they're being sponsored by the Zubel family. And this is uh, Dave and Vicki Tichamara. That Mara or Mara? Mara. Did I say it right? OK. And their daughter, Olivia, being sponsored by Denise Blake. And here we have the Basakos. 
this is, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look it up because I'm gonna get your names wrong if I don't, and I apologize for that. Now it is, I was gonna be right, Christopher and Carol Misako being sponsored by Candy Forey. And here is Jean, we're gonna ask this, Jean. McLennigan being sponsored by Don, Dottie Schoenewald. And Marilyn, I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing, Marilyn, step forward. This is Marilyn Mitchell uh, being sponsored here by Don and Ruth Ann Painter. And over here on the far end, we have uh, Darcy and Robert Murphy being sponsored here by, oh, that's right, the McDonald's. That's why they couldn't be. I'm like, where are their sponsors? They're, they're on the church camping trip. So welcome all of them, please. <laughs> welcome to the life of our congregation. Please, when you see them, come over to coffee hour and greet them. Return to your seats. Thank you. Turn to their seats. I'll invite everyone else to rise and greet them because we're going to share the peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Heavenly Father, with the prophet Isaiah, hear us pray, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Give to your whole church, our mission partners, our synod who met in assembly this week, and our own congregation the boldness to bear witness to Christ to the glory of God. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, O Lord, for the new life that is poured out upon all who are born anew in the water and spirit of holy baptism. For the power of the Holy Spirit, help all the baptized to let their light so shine before others that you alone may be glorified. Lord, in your mercy. We praise and thank you, O God, for the gift of education. In the upcoming summer recess, Grand renewal to teachers, school administrators, students, and those who have labored in our Sunday school program this year to grow in the knowledge of you. Pour out your blessing upon those beginning of internships, as well as those graduates looking for employment, and renew us that we may apply ourselves again to our studies. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, O Lord for your love for the world that was made known in the death of your only begotten Son, Jesus. We pray for those who suffer for the sake of the Gospel all around this world. In the eyes of all people, especially our enemies, by their witness be turned to Jesus and so saved. Lord, in your mercy. We praise, thank, and glorify you, Holy Father, that you are eager to hear our prayers. We pray for those who are sick, those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, as well as those suffering who is not known or seen by others. We lift before you at this time Fred Beaver, Ellen Mark, and those whose names we lift now. That your healing mercy may make them well. Lord, in your mercy. And also we praise, thank, and glorify you for the witness of those saints who have preceded us, especially those who have most recently died. We remember, especially at this time, the family of Constance Kern. Comfort all who mourn with a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Spirit, bless you now and forever.
Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.